Hey everyone, welcome to my presentation on active learning for natural language processing. Uh, my name is Robert Munro and I run the Bay Area NLP Meetup Group, uh, but I'm here today hosted by the Hungarian NLP Meetup Group. Uh, and I know we've got a, a lot of other people from communities around the world joining us too. I'm aware of people in uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Malaysia, and South Africa, uh, all across Europe and all across North and South America uh, joining us today. Uh, so I'm glad that you're able to uh, to take part uh, today, no matter what time of day or, or uh, even uh, day of the week uh, that you're joining us. And for the presentation itself, I've actually pre-recorded this component. Uh, so what that means, if you're watching us live on Zoom right now, not watching later on YouTube, if you're watching live on Zoom, uh, I can take your questions as we go. Um, they should be able to see me in the, the Zoom chat if you would like to bring that up. So I'm happy to take your questions uh, via text on the, the Zoom chat uh, as this presentation goes. And then we're also going to have time at the end. Uh, so at the end of the, the presentation, um, I'll be able to, to answer some of your, your questions live. Um, uh, thanks to our hosts there. And so uh, no matter what your background is, whether it's natural language processing, whether you're an engineer who's interested in natural language processing, or if you're in an adjacent field like information retrieval, or speech recognition, or machine translation, uh, I hope that there is going to be uh, something interesting for you um, in, in this talk today. Uh, so the talk I'm giving is an excerpt uh, from my book, Human in the Loop, Machine Learning. And it's answering what I think is one of the most important questions in, in technology today. Uh, how can humans and machines work together to solve problems? And so those of you working machine learning know about 90% of machine learning applications improve with human feedback. Uh, they typically use supervised learning or something really closely related like likely supervised learning. And human feedback can help machines understand confusing or a new data. And this uh, applies to a whole range of different use cases. So whether it's commands spoken uh, that are sent to your smart devices, uh, videos from the front of autonomous vehicles, or information extraction uh, from healthcare related uh, messages. Uh, all these cases that I've, I've worked on recently, uh, additional human feedback uh, increases the accuracy. Uh, so a, a typical human in the loop feedback system could look something like this. You have a deployed machine learning model uh, you uh, employ active learning, the main topic of this talk, uh, to look at the most interesting items for human to review. Humans review those items, uh, they create the annotations on those items, which creates the training data, uh, and then you can create your machine learning model to be redeployed. You can also use transfer learning, and transfer learning um, is the process of taking existing models and adapting it uh, to your case, uh, to kickstart or to, to augment your machine learning algorithm. The focus on this talk, uh, active learning, uh, is important when you have a very large number of unlabeled data items uh, and you might not have the capacity uh, to employ people uh, to manually annotate all of those items. Uh, so this comes from uh, part two of my book uh, where I talk about different active learning methods, uncertainty sampling, diversity sampling, and advanced methods. I'll go through all of these in the presentation today. Uh, these chapters are already out. And then I'll give a sneak preview of a couple of topics from chapters 9 and 10, which are uh, the next two chapters that I'll be publishing in the book uh, about advanced quality control and transfer learning methods that are um, uh, very cutting edge and, and related to some of the interesting more recent advances in active learning. Uh, so why would you use active learning? Accuracy is often cited as the main one. So let's say you have budget to only take 1% of your unlabeled data. You want to make sure that it's the, the most important 1%. Uh, speed is often uh, another important factor. You want your model to be more accurate more quickly. Uh, and this has often been the, the primary use case uh, for myself when I've used active learning in disaster response situations. Uh, I want to be able to, to translate or filter or extract information uh, from messages following a disaster, sometimes in languages for which we have no existing annotations. And so being able to get a model up quickly and iterate on that um, is something that um, can help save lives. And so in, in that case, it's less about um, the amount of human input, more about the speed of uh, getting a good model out as quickly as possible uh, with all the data that we can feasibly annotate. Uh, and then finally, diversity. Uh, so unless you're looking at academic data sets, a random sample of unlabeled data is, is typically biased. Uh, the, the unlabeled data that you have available to you, your raw data, 
uh, would typically be oversampling from from some data source, um, and a lot of the time that that data source may be itself overrepresenting uh, more privileged people. In natural language processing, the most obvious use case is when you have large amounts of text data, English will tend to be overrepresented. English only makes up about 5% of the world's conversations daily, but it makes up for a lot, much larger percent of almost all uh, text data sets uh, which are out there. Uh, and so uh, selecting through different languages is, is fairly easy with language identification. Um, we can have uh, more subtle but equally uh, problematic ways that your data might be biased. So uh, before I start, I'd like to debunk three active learning myths, which are very pervasive. Uh, one is that active learning and random sampling converge with enough data. Uh, and so this is only true in academic data sets where active learning is simulated. Uh, the argument here being that you don't need active learning if you have a, enough budget, because once you've annotated, you know, say, a few hundred thousand items, uh, your model is going to be just as accurate um, from random sampling as it was from using active learning. Uh, this simply isn't the true unless you only started with 100,000 items. Uh, unfortunately, academic data sets are randomly sampled. So maybe an academic data set has 100,000 items which are randomly sampled from a pool of a million items that you no longer have access to or the ability to create labels for. So if you look at a lot of academic papers which are simulating active learning, um, uh, it can uh, mislead you um, as to the effectiveness of, of active learning. Uh, another is that uncertainty is tractable and can be read directly uh, from softmax. Uh, so I've seen people as prominent as Jan Lacoon uh, claiming this recently, uh, and this simply isn't the case. Uh, so if you have a binary classification task, you can read um, the confidence directly from your softmax output, but anything more complicated than a simple binary classification task uh, means that there are multiple different ways of calculating uncertainty. Um, and no one way is guaranteed to be the most optimal way for, for your data. And calculating the, the optimal uncertainty uh, for any, anything beyond a binary task is an optimization task in its own right. Uh, in fact, a lot of the advanced uncertainty sampling methods are themselves uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, finally, um, related to uncertainty, um, uh, one of the myths is that softmax um, base of E, um, Euler's number, is a special case of, of that number. Uh, and that simply isn't the case. Um, in fact, if um, you converge your model with um, a different softmax value, you, you'll get um, the, the same model optimization. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this isn't a case where um, your Euler's number is, is special. And while changing the, the base, or equivalently the temperature of uh, your softmax output, won't change uh, what is the most confidently predicted item and therefore won't change your accuracy, uh, it can in fact change the rank ordering of items. Um, so what is the most uncertain item from your pool from one base or equivalently temperature from softmax will be different um, if you change that. Um, and you'll, you'll find um, uh, this myth perpetuated out there, this, this is a special case for, for Euler's number when it is not. Um, uh, and you'll also find that almost all of the active learning literature um, ignores uh, this as an additional parameter um, uh, that, that needs to be looked at. Uh, so while um, uh, the second two of, uh, of these myths here uh, do make active learning a more complicated problem um, than many people assume going in, it also makes it a more interesting problem uh, as well. Uh, it's a, a new area where we can look at models. Uh, these models are inherently looking at the interaction between machine learning uncertainty and human understanding. Uh, and so any time spent um, working on these kinds of problems um, teaches us a lot about how humans and machines can solve problems together. Uh, before I, I jump into the, um, the methods themselves, I want to give an idea of how popular active learning and human learning processing is right now. Uh, so I'm going to go through 10 examples here uh, and the, the benefits um, uh, that come from using uh, human in the loop machine learning. Uh, so avoiding bias. Um, AI will have biases which are different uh, to human biases, and so having a human in the loop um, of decision making is one way uh, to, uh, uh, to avoid um, uh, biases uh, in both humans or AI. Uh, it's also a way to create employment. So by some measures, the majority of people working in machine learning are creating training data, or actually more people labeling data than creating algorithms for artificial intelligence. Uh, and when done properly, uh, creating employment for human labeling uh, 
uh, can become a great way of bringing people into the information economy who previously wouldn't um, have been able to, to work in the information economy. Uh, and again, when done properly, uh, quality controls uh, can be a lot more egalitarian. Uh, so the demographics of a person um, uh, should not necessarily affect uh, the quality of their task, um, meaning that uh, it's more of a meritocracy uh, in terms of being rewarded for your work. Uh, human in the loop process is also important for augmenting rare data. Uh, so in this example at Facebook, looking at misinformation, uh, you can imagine that for very rare languages, there isn't even uh, enough unlabeled examples um, uh, to build training data sets. Certainly not enough to get to the same level of, of accuracy as for a language as English. Uh, and so having a human in the loop uh, can augment rare data um, and uh, is another way of avoiding bias. Um, in this case, bias towards the amount of um, uh, available training data. Human loop processing is also a great way to maintain high precision. It's a really good example of autonomous vehicles, in this case, helicopters. Uh, so you certainly don't want a helicopter to have a full like below human level accuracy. And there are interesting UX implications about what's the right way for a machine to back off uh, to a human and tell the human that it needs to, to take over. Uh, similar to, to pilots and helicopters, um, a human in the loop machine learning can be used to incorporate subject matter experts. Uh, so in this particular example here, it's uh, experts in, in looking at uh, surveillance of potentially legal behavior in, in markets. Uh, and human in the loop machine learning enables uh, these experts to create training data in, in ways that would not be available to, to non-experts um, and uh, keep them employed in this process. Uh, similar to this, uh, in auditing use cases, uh, you need consistency and accuracy. Uh, this might be court ordered. And so while you do need machine learning to scale, um, you also need to, to ensure that you need human level consistency and accuracy. Uh, and related to this again, uh, human loop processes can make work easier. Uh, so in this example of cybersecurity, it's automating some of the tasks uh, that a security analyst um, is able to, to work in, um, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, and uh, related to, to making an expert more efficient, but not necessarily replacing them, um, in a lot of medical use cases, we're seeing um, doctors um, and other healthcare professionals use machine learning as part of their decision process, um, but not being replaced by it. Uh, finally, you can use human in the loop machine learning to provide uh, transparent accountability and increase safety. Uh, so in this particular example for uh, visa applicants, uh, the system backs off to a human only in the negative case. So if an automated system rejects someone's visa, that's double checked by a human. Um, uh, so this is a use case where uh, some of the outputs, they're, they're, they're happy for, um, or willing to accept some false positives going through. So maybe people getting visas that shouldn't have. Um, but for the, the negative use cases, um, they're not going to, to allow those um, uh, to necessarily um, uh, um, affect someone's uh, life without further human review. Uh, and finally, is a, um, a kind of a fun use case where Formula One is testing uh, changes to um, the rules uh, using uh, people playing esports, using gamers to test out the, those change rules and then look at the safety implications there. And so uh, all of these use cases you just looked at were reported within one month of each other. Uh, so hopefully this gives you a really good idea of how widely adopted human in the loop machine learning is right now. Certainly we, we hear about a lot of different kinds of advances in, in AI and in NLP in, in particular with, with a lot of really fun advances recently in pre-trained models. Um, but certainly there are no recent advances that you can point to that have been so clearly adopted across so many industries in, in the real world. And obviously something that's really missing is a lot of information about how to implement um, uh, these different methods. Uh, not many people get taught about active learning or human annotation in their undergraduate courses. Uh, and I think this is a real gap that, that I'm trying to fill uh, with my book. So one way that you can think about these different methods is uh, in a knowledge quadrant. What are your known knowns, your known unknowns, your unknown knowns, and your unknown unknowns. Uh, and so to go through all of these in turn, your known knowns are your current model. Uh, it's confident predictions. Uh, so anything your model is confidently predicting and getting correct, these are what your model knows that it knows. Your known unknowns is what your model knows that it doesn't know. Uh, so if you have a binary classification task, these are everything that are around 50% confident, um, everything right at the decision boundary. Uh, so your model knows that it's uncertain uh, in these particular uh, cases, uh, and this is where we use uncertainty sampling 
now one of the, the um, uh, types of active learning that we'll talk about today, and uh, certainly sampling targets uh, items near the decision boundary. Your unknown unknowns, needless to say, are, are harder to identify. Uh, so how do you know when you don't know something? Uh, these are gaps in your, your current model knowledge. And the, the set of uh, methods for trying to work out what you don't know that you don't know are known as diversity sampling. And we'll go through uh, some examples of, of these um, in today's talk as well. And we're only going to touch on it briefly, but to, to round out the, the quadrant, uh, transfer learning are your unknown knowns. Um, so what latent information is there in related machine learning models um, uh, they don't know is there yet, but if you adapt to your current problem, it uh, might be useful for, um, uh, for increasing your, your model's accuracy. So to begin with, we're going to look at uncertainty sampling. So when your, your model is confused uh, and you want to sample those items because those are the most likely to be predicted incorrectly, um, because the closer to the decision boundary, the most likely to move that decision boundary if they are currently incorrect. Uh, so here's an example of a simple binary task. We have label A and label B. And uncertainty sampling should ideally target these five items with uh, the question marks in the middle of them. Uh, so these have been selected to label because these are the five closest uh, to the decision boundary. Uh, so active learning, you might uh, apply your model to millions and millions of um, unlabeled items, and then you're selecting those which, um, are in this case, the most uncertain. Uh, and for a work example, let's assume that we have a full class prediction task um, uh, shown here on the, the left, uh, which could be expressed as a, as a PyTorch tensor here on the right. Uh, so we've predicted uh, y0, y1, uh, y2, and y3. Um, and uh, the most confident item is 64.39% uh, um, with our four labels. And we can build on uh, this typical output from softmax, uh, uh, known as a probability distribution, uh, and to look at different kinds of uncertainty sampling. Uh, just to flag, um, the outputs of softmax are not um, strictly probabilities, um, but when you have outputs that sum to one, um, this is known mathematically as a probability distribution. Um, I go into more detail about the, the pros and cons of, of softmax in my book. Um, uh, but I won't go into to more detail in the, the talk here today. So the most commonly used uncertainty sampling method, and probably um, one that you have used um, in the past, is least confident sampling. And so this is simply looking at the difference between the most confident prediction and complete confidence, 100% confidence. So here our most confident prediction is 64% confidence, 64% confident, um, and we are able to... Um, uh, take that and know that because there's four items, uh, it couldn't be less than 25% confident. That would be the minimum. Uh, so here we just have that, that denominator as a normalizing function uh, to give us a, a naught to one range, where range is the uh, where one is the most uncertain. Uh, and all of our methods will, will be in a naught to one range. So this is something I highly recommend. Uh, otherwise, you will get uh, different ranges from different uncertainty sampling methods and, and, and some one will be more uncertain and, and others zero will be more uncertain. Um, uh, and if you don't remember to normalize them, you're going to get into a lot of trouble in, in downstream processing. Um, and also uh, depending on the, the type of methods you're using, some downstream processes will assume um, a zero to one range. Uh, so margin of confidence is the difference between the top two most confident predictions. Um, so this is also something you might have used in the past. So here, the most confident prediction is 64%. Uh, the next most is 23%. So we're looking at the difference between them, and again, normalizing for the, the maximum possible difference. Related to margin of confidence, ratio of confidence looks at the ratio between the top two most confident predictions rather than the difference. Um, and we don't need to normalize this because the, the smaller of the two divided by the larger of the two is um, already in that not to one range. Uh, this is actually more mathematically well motivated than uh, taking the difference. Um, it's more mathematically well motivated to take ratio, but it's rarer in the academic literature. Uh, and this is mainly because um, the, uh, the methods predate um, uh, the current types of um, machine learning algorithms that we're using. Um, uh, but even though ratio of confidence is rarer, um, this should actually give you a, a more accurate um, uh, indication of the difference between the top two most confident items. Finally, uh, entropy uh, uses information theory uh, uh, to look at all of the predictions. Uh, so in this case, it's looking at the, the difference between all of these predictions and 
um, uh, predictions with no information, which would be the case that they were all 25% confident. Um, and so entropy takes into account all of the predictions, uh, not just the, the top two or uh, the top one, uh, like you saw with uh, least confident predictions. And so uh, any of these four methods might be the most appropriate one to use with your data. Um, and you don't know without testing. Uh, so you should try out these different methods if you're using active learning um, and see what's right for your data. To get an intuition for, for what these different methods do, uh, you can play around with it, and I'll, I'll share this link in the, the chat as well, um, uh, at my website here. Um, so if you uh, go to that site, you can click and make your own labels. Uh, here on the top left, where we can assume that we have three labels. Uh, these are the three black dots. And here are how these four different methods for uncertainty sampling pattern. So you can see that the, the two that look at uh, pairwise uh, confusion, margin of confidence and ratio of confidence, um, uh, we have these long bands coming out uh, where uh, pairwise confusion is enough. Um, uh, you can sample the uncertain items there, uh, the most read items. Whereas entropy, uh, which looks at confusion across all of the items, um, it concentrates where it samples right in the middle of those three. At least confidence uh, falls somewhere in between. Um, you kind of get a secondary effect of looking only at the most confident that it, it effectively also takes into account uh, the other items as well. And if you look at the, the right-hand side in the four examples here, uh, you can see that with a, a large number of labels and a relatively random pattern, uh, the area um, of items that will get sampled as being the most uncertain are very, very different. Uh, and so uh, it's really important to, to think about what are the right um, uh, methods that might be right for your data to get an intuition for what kind of confusion is most important to you. Is pairwise the most important? Is it confusion across all your labels? Uh, and that can often be the best starting point uh, for deciding which of these heuristics is the, the best one to begin with uh, for uncertainty sampling. Um, and then you can think about trying the other methods um, and also building out uh, some of the more uh, complicated uncertainty sampling algorithms on top of them uh, that we'll be looking at later. Uh, there's uh, also some interesting more recent techniques using Monte Carlo dropouts. Um, and so uh, you've probably done this in training your models before, um, randomly uh, dropped out certain neurons during the training process so as not to overfit your model, uh, applying uh, the same uh, technique at prediction time and then get in multiple predictions uh, across um, the, the models with different dropouts, um, sometimes known as Bayesian deep learning. Um, and it's called that because if you squint at the, the range of predictions that you get, it'll look like a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. That's, that's somewhat pretentiously called um, uh, Bayesian deep learning. Uh, it's certainly like a great method to use if, uh, for example, you don't get um, reliable uh, confidence estimates for your predictions because of the type of architecture you're using. Um, and you can look at variation in terms of um, the actual model outputs, um, uh, the logits, um, or uh, even just the, the labels themselves. So that's what you have access to. Um, so look at that and switch the most variable in that, the labels. And this builds on a, a long history of using ensemble methods, which is sometimes called uncertainty by, uh, by committee in active learning literature. So that's uncertainty sampling. Uh, we're now going to move on to diversity sampling. So diversity sampling is uh, trying to find what you don't know that you don't yet know. Uh, so these are uh, gaps uh, in your model knowledge. And uh, the hard thing um, uh, is uh, obviously you, you don't know in advance what you don't know. So uh, to go back to our example of the binary classification task, uh, diversity sampling are looking, is looking to sample items that are very different from what has, labeled, uh, has been labeled before and also different from each other. Uh, so here are five items uh, that have been sampled to be labeled through diversity sampling. And you can see, at least in this data set, they're the furthest from what's been labeled so far and uh, different from each other. Uh, so sticking with, with our models, um, one way to look uh, for outliers are things which have low activation in your models, uh, low activation of logits in the hidden layers. Uh, so one of the problems with softmax is that it hides the, uh, the scale of uh, the inputs. Um, so for example, if you have inputs of one, two, three, and four, the softmax distribution is going to be exactly the same as if those inputs were 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. Uh, and so you don't know what might be confusing to your model because of conflicted information versus no information at all. And so looking at the, uh, the average rate of activation um, uh, across your model um, uh, is one way of, of finding something that your model simply hasn't seen before. 
and then this is evidence that it might be something new or, or previously unencountered, uh, certainly something that, that doesn't appear very often in your training data, um, at least not in a way that um, it resulted in your model um, uh, being able to find much information from it. Uh, and you can experiment with which kinds of layers um, you want to look at. Obviously, if it's earlier layers, it's closer to your data. If it's later layers, it's closer to your uh, prediction space. Uh, that can be more interesting, um, but then that more likely to be biased uh, towards your, your current model. Cluster-based sampling is probably the most common method of, of diversity sampling. Uh, and so that is simply clustering your data and selecting from, from each cluster uh, equally. Uh, representative sampling, you can think of as a variation on clustering. Uh, so you can think of it as creating one cluster that contains all your current training data and a second cluster that contains all the data that doesn't currently have a label. Uh, and so then you can look at what item looks most like your unlabeled relative to your current training data. Uh, so what do you not currently have a label for that looks like other things you don't have a label for? Um, uh, and so uh, especially if you're looking at domain adaptation, uh, this can be a really effective method of uh, quickly identifying the, the most promising looking items uh, from your unlabeled data in the domain that you're trying to adapt to. A uh, final example is uh, real world diversity. So increasing fairness with data supporting real world diversity. Um, this could be demographics uh, relating to people um, like uh, gender or ethnicity or language is spoken um, or other demographics that you care about in the real world for your data, like maybe time of day, day of week um, uh, or other kinds of metadata. Uh, and so uh, structured for real world diversity means looking at, uh, again, distribution relative to your current training data uh, in this case, knowing that you have other demographic information about your data, um, looking to see whether your data is uh, representative or not. Um, something to remember here is that uh, this will depend on your model architecture too. In some models, your data will need to be representative, otherwise biases will be um, perpetuated. Uh, in other cases, you only need a minimum amount of data um, to avoid biases. So most methods for uh, successful active learning combine the two. Uh, uh, uncertainty sampling alone, will tend to pick items that look too much like each other, and diversity sampling alone will pick items too far from the decision boundary. So ideally, you want a combination of diversity sampling and uncertainty sampling. It'll sample items like these five here. These five are all close to the current decision boundary, uh, but they're also far from each other. And I, I give a dozen or so uh, examples of this um, in my book. Uh, I'll go through uh, just two um, of them here. Uh, to get an idea of uh, how to combine them. Uh, most of the ways for, for combining them are fairly simple. You apply one method uh, and then you apply another immediately following. Uh, and this is one of those, uncertainty sampling and clustering. Uh, so initially, uh, we'll apply uncertainty sampling and sample, in this case, something like just a 50% of unlabeled items which happen to be closest to the decision boundary, discarding the 50% which are further from the decision boundary. Then with those closest to the decision boundary, will apply cluster in uh, and then sample items uh, equally from within each cluster. So obviously that cluster in the middle would have got way more if we're just randomly sampling. Um, uh, and uh, we want diversity as well as uncertainty. Uh, so here uh, we're getting that nice distribution of items near the decision boundary, uh, but distant from each other. Uh, and this is a really simple but, but powerful method. Uh, unfortunately, you won't see it much in the literature uh, because most academic papers only look at individual methods in isolation um, and, and then compare them for, for their relative value. Um, and also, it's not probably worthy of an academic paper uh, for the, the two lines of code uh, to pipe uh, your sample out of one method and, and into another. Um, and that's fair enough for an academic paper, but, but certainly for practical active learning, uh, it's worth looking at some of these simple combinations. And you'll find that um, in addition to a number of these being in the book, uh, these are also in the, the open source code um, uh, that's uh, released with the book um, uh, using Python, uh, using PyTorch for the uh, machine learning components. One of the um, more advanced and interesting recent techniques um, uh, for combining uncertainty sampling and diversity sampling is uh, active transfer learning uh, for adaptive sampling, or ATLAS um, for short. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, transfer learning already. You have a model that is trained on one task, in this case predicting A, B, C, and D. You have uh, some data, maybe only a small amount of data, uh, labeled for W, X, Y, and Z, or Z, depending on where you're joining us from. 
uh, and then you can train maybe just one new output layer um, to predict these, uh, uh, these, uh, these new labels. And the advantage here is that you essentially get the representations from uh, a potentially bigger data set for A, B, C, and D um, uh, for your uh, W, X, Y, and, and Z data set. So what's nice about transfer learning is that it doesn't matter what these other labels are. So these other labels can be something that you derive from the data itself. So let's imagine that you have held out validation data also labeled uh, A, B, C, and D. So we care just about the A, B, C, and D task here. We can put that validation data through our model and then bucket everything into correct and incorrect. Um, so let's say that we got half of our validation data correct, half of it incorrect. We can now create a, uh, a new output layer to predict correct or incorrect. Uh, so it's a binary classification task that's trained on our validation data and for any new unlabeled items, it is now essentially a classifier um, uh, telling us uh, with what confidence we can expect all our unlabeled data uh, to be either correct or incorrect. Then we can find whatever is the most highest confidence of being incorrect. Um, and we can know that, well, this is something that we want a human to review. Now, if we think our model is getting it wrong, we want a human to validate that. Uh, we want to update our training data accordingly uh, and then that's um, one of the most likely items uh, for us to be able to increase the accuracy of our, of our model uh, going forward. What's nice about this kind of process is that because we don't know what the actual label is yet, but we don't care about it, we can make this adaptive before we even get that human feedback. Uh, so we know that once our model has seen this item, the incorrect item, gets a human label, we know that that item and items which are similar to it are gonna be labeled correctly because uh, our model is now trained on that particular item. So we can make this assumption that no matter what the label is, we don't know what it is yet, but we do know that that will be labeled correctly and uh, were that added to the validation data, it will most certainly be correct again, um, uh, correct if predicted again later. We can then switch uh, to the other bucket. We can now give it the correct label um, and retrain our model um, with uh, this now in the correct bucket. And this will give us the diversity component. Um, so we'll, we'll focus initially on, on the area that, that has the most incorrect items, most confidently incorrect items. But once we have maybe just a handful of those, which we know that we will later get correct, um, uh, and then uh, retrain our model accordingly, um, uh, then it'll start to sample uh, items from other parts um, of, of the uncertainty space. So this is a nice way of combining uncertainty sampling and diversity sampling um, into a single algorithm. Um, and certainly you can have more complicated transfer learning models where with more new layers or using different layers into the output layer. Um, but you probably only have a little bit of validation data and having just a single binary task on uh, for your new output layer uh, means you can probably get away with without much hyperparameter tuning. Um, and so again, if you look at the, the example open source uh, code, uh, there's implementations of active transfer learning for adaptive sampling that retrains a, a, new, um, uh, a new output binary layer like this on the validation data and adaptively samples. Uh, in that particular uh, use case, uh, you'll see that we're looking at disaster response, um, a related example. Uh, and so looking at that text should, should also give you an intuition uh, for the kind of things that get sampled. Uh, so finally, just a quick sneak preview into uh, some content from upcoming chapters related to uh, transfer learning. Uh, so again, uh, similar to, to this method of transfer learning, can we take the output from one model and, and use it in another? Uh, in this case, rather than retraining a model for a new task, we're using uh, one model as a representation in your models. Um, so this is what I'm sure you've done with, with things like embeddings before. What's interesting here though, is that you might have some tasks which are much, much faster than others. Uh, so let's say you want to label A and B, uh, but it's a very complicated task. You require subject matter experts, it takes them a long time to make a decision about label A versus label B. Uh, maybe some sort of complicated medical diagnosis or financial um, analysis. However, you have an adjacent task, um, which you know that you can give to crowdsource workers and they can do it really high speed. And so while it's not uh, the task you're looking for is closely related to it, and maybe you can do that 100 uh, times faster or, or cheaper, um, and then use that as a representation. 
And so there's a really interesting paper here uh, called Intermediate Training, uh, and it's um, called uh, Intermediate Task Training uh, because uh, they actually begin with a pre-trained model. Um, uh, and then they, they use um, like the, the YZ model here as the intermediate one, and then AB for the output layer. Uh, and this really interesting currently under review work uh, shows that uh, even when they are looking at tasks outside of English, as their, their AB task in this case, uh, they can do intermediate training um, on a multilingual model just in English um, on a semantically related task, and uh, it actually improves the, the output from, uh, from non-English tasks. So it doesn't have to be too adjacent uh, to, uh, to get some accuracies here. Uh, in their particular paper, they're, they're just looking at existing um, uh, academic data sets. Uh, but this has some really interesting implications for active learning and annotation as well. You might train your, uh, change your entire strategy um, in, in order to get high uh, volume of adjacent and easier to get labels uh, rather than what your target task is. Um, and then you can apply uh, all of the uncertainty sampling and diversity sampling techniques uh, to this model as well. In fact, to both of the models, um, you might want to look at um, uh, some active learning within the, the YZ model uh, in addition to the, the AB model. And I think we're, we're really just scratching the surface of the, the possibilities here uh, for the, the kinds of use cases that, that we can use for transfer learning and active learning. Uh, so it's an, an exciting new area. So uh, some general advice. Um, build a system, then refine it. Uh, so chapter two of my book is a working human and loop machine learning system with 500 lines of code. There's some basic uncertainty sampling, some basic diversity sampling, a basic annotation interface, and a model that automatically retrains itself um, uh, every, every uh, period of, of active learning. Uh, and so doing this, um, taking it into the second point here, lets you look at your data, uh, so you're annotating your data quickly itself, It'll give you an intuition about what's going through and what the best algorithm might be. Um, and then with your working very simple system, you should also get an intuition about what is the next best step to improve the accuracy. Is it improving the, the model? Is it improving the annotation interface? Is it improving the active learning methods uh, to sample the, the right data? Um, it may be that you're already close enough to optimal and then one or more of the components of a working human middle loop system. Um, and so, um, rather than try and build state-of-the-art systems for every component of a complicated human loop system from scratch, uh, you can start with something simple and, and build on it from there. Uh, finally, I'd, I'd advise to be realistic about time to reach accuracy. Um, it's really hard in advance uh, to predict what level of accuracy you're going to have from, from your model downstream. Um, uh, so if you can think of a way to productize your human loop system that provides value from the get-go, um, uh, then you're, you're going to be in a position for success. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any, any questions now. I'll, I can take these uh, directly in the, in the Zoom chat uh, for those, uh, uh, those watching live. Uh, and if you're interested in a copy of my book, um, you can get 50% off here uh, with the code TSLOOP um, at uh, bit.ly uh, underscore Hamel underscore book. Um, or if you just go to manning.com and look for human in the loop machine learning. Uh, you should find it there. All right, well, thanks everyone. Uh, I, I appreciate you coming to this presentation and I look forward to your questions.